Hello, and welcome to the International Society for Science and Religions, ISSR, YouTube channel. My name is Anthony Nairn, and I'm the Executive Assistant of ISSR. Today, I am pleased to introduce what we are hoping will be the first episode in a running series, which will have ISSR fellows in conversation with one other scholar or fellow on topics related to research, interests, matters of issue, and other such topics. We hope that this series will appeal to both academics and to the general public alike. We are proponents of the free and open exchange of ideas and believe that sharing such exchanges of ideas and knowledge like this through conversation is a critical way to bring forth a more wise and approachable use value for claims made in the academy to the general public. Today, I bring to you a timely conversation. As you may know, on 26 December of 2021, E.O. Wilson died at the age of 92. Edward Osborne Wilson was the Pellegrino University Research Professor Emeritus of Entomology at Harvard University. He was, however, most well known outside of biology for his book Sociobiology and New Synthesis, which was released in 1975. This new synthesis, while at its core not a new idea, was released really amidst a more diverse political landscape, one that would play heavily into the controversy surrounding the text. Yet, because of the reach of the text, Controversy swirled inside the academy as well, especially from the social sciences of anthropology and sociology. The controversy surrounding sociobiology aside, Wilson was a prolific writer, winning two Pulitzer Prizes for general nonfiction and a winner of many other awards and prizes throughout his long career within and outside of the academy. From professional science organizations to communication platforms like TED, to communication awards like the Carl Sagan Award for Public Understanding of Science. While never directly addressing the field of science and religion, Wilson's work and life often touched upon it. Sociobiology would claim that religion is a naturally selected behavior, and his work, Consilience, attempted to bring together the sciences and the humanities. And his work in The Creation, Wilson asked for religious and scientific leaders to come together to tackle climate change. Today's talk brings ISSR fellow Michael Roos, the Lucille T. Verkmeister Professor and Director of the History and Philosophy of Science program at Florida State University, together with ISSR President Michael Rice, Professor of Science Education at University College London. Please enjoy this episode of ISSR's In Conversation. Michael, really good to see you as always. And now, you too, Michael. Thank you oh. very much. Now, look, you knew Ed Wilson much better than I did. So so let's start by just telling me a bit about your memories of him as a person. OK, I um, first met Ed Wilson, I think, in uh, 1979, maybe 1980. Uh, I had a former student who was a, uh, an untenured junior faculty member at Harvard. And uh, so my wife and I uh, went to stay with him and he, he said, you must go and meet Ed Wilson. Now, why would I want to, why would he think I might want to uh, meet Ed Wilson? Mainly, well, completely because uh, although Ed Wilson was a, an ant specialist, and I'm sure we can go back over his career earlier, um, he, in 1975, had produced this absolutely massive book, Sociobiology, The New Synthesis, uh, where what he was doing right from the, as it were, from ants to humans, he was trying to show that not only are we social animals, but that this is very directly controlled by evolution, by evolution through natural selection. Uh, as it happens, this was the red flag for a number of left-wing biologists, including people in his own department, uh, Richard Lewinton, Dick Lewinton, and none other than Stephen Jay Gould, uh, who uh, by 1980 was already, you know, rapidly on the rise to becoming probably the most prominent evolutionist in the world after Richard Dawkins. Uh, they, they can wrestle over that one themselves. Uh, so I, I'm an Englishman, as you can tell from my accent. And even before the Marxists started to get all involved, I read Wilson and I said, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't agree with everything he wants to say, but yeah, this is the approach. Now, 
Why did I take that approach? Because I'd grown up in the 1950s watching things like the Brains Trust on the BBC, which had people like Julian Huxley and J.B.S. Haldane, good leftists, good, I mean, Haldane was a Marxist, who took it as absolutely a priori given that we humans are part of the process. That obviously, there's going to be different things. I mean, we're going to speak and elephants don't speak. Elephants have big trunks and we don't, but you know, we're all part of the overall picture. So it never dawned on me. And of course, you know, I read Darwin and the descent of man. So it never dawned on me uh, that it would be ideologically unacceptable to take Darwinism and apply it to humans. I mean, as I say, there's lots of places you might want to argue about this, whether or not, for instance, the, you know, are women superior or equal or less? I mean, you can spend a lot of time arguing about that. We still do. But the idea that, let's say, uh, the differences between men and women have, it has nothing to do with biology just never crossed my mind. And so I started in, I gave a paper, and then uh, I, I started in writing a book. And as you can imagine, oh my God, hell descended on me. It was a bit, little bit like Global Warming Plus. <laughs> and the, the interesting thing was that, I won't say all of the philosophers, but almost all of the philosophers were on the Marxist side. I mean, I don't say that they were Marxists, but they were very strongly on the side of, yes, humans are different, uh, uh, that sort of thing. And so um, I, you know, uh, I found myself on the outs of my fellow philosophers as well. So going, as I say, going, I mean, I, I didn't go to Harvard to meet Wilson. I went to Harvard to, to stay with and visit my, you know, my former student and be taken around Boston and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but he said, we must go and meet Wilson. And I did. And Wilson was, you know, as always, very charming. He'd heard of me because, you know, I'd made sure to send him stuff. I mean, this was pre-email, but, you know, there was still the postal service worked in those days. And uh, so he knew about me. I mean, he didn't know much about me. I, I knew a lot more about him than he knew about me. But he was very friendly and uh, very warm uh, and, and that sort of thing. Now, I will say one thing. We can pick up on this later. He had on the wall a picture of Herbert Spencer, which was considerably more prominent and larger than his picture of Charles Darwin. I, I should say also, the biggest picture on his wall was of Ed Wilson getting the, what is it, the US Medal of Science from Jimmy Carter, the then president, but he got his priorities right. But I said to him, I, I think I said, Professor Wilson, I might even at those days have said Ed, uh, you know, Herbert Spencer, great man, Mike, great man. I want to pick up on that later. Uh, anyhow, uh, we, we got on well, uh, but I thought that was probably the end of it. Uh, then what happened was I got involved in the next, I mean, I, I, I like controversies. Uh, uh, and so I got involved in the, uh, in the, the next year. I, I say I like controversies. Michael Reese, you know about this because we've been right, we, we've been, we're writing a book on the new biology and that's very controversial. I mean, that's the sort of thing that uh, I like to do and obviously you like to do. So anyhow, the next year, I, my attention was directed to the creationist issue. And creationism was a big thing. Henry Morris and Dwayne T. Gish, author of Evolution, the Fossils Say No, 150,000 copies sold, and, and so on and so forth. And so I got involved in this. And uh, you, you may remember, Michael, because you're a very old man, but uh, your audience our audience won't remember, but 1981, the state of Arkansas, that's one of the southern states, passed a law saying, if you're going to teach evolution in the state-funded uh, public schools, I mean, by public school, I don't mean the English private school, I mean uh, state finance, you know, like grammar schools and that sort of thing. Uh, if you're going to teach evolution, then you also had to teach creationism. Uh, balanced treatment, well, of course, the American Civil Liberties Union went, you know, ape, whatever it is we call it in those, in those days, and said, no, this is a violation of the First Amendment separation of church and state. They brought a case against it, and they started to line up expert witnesses. And I've already mentioned Steve Gould, and he was one. And uh, again, for you folks, uh, Langdon Gilkey, who was at the time, I mean, he's dead now, but the most eminent Protestant theologian in America was another. And they agonized 
did they need a philosopher or not? And the way that they were doing this was one of the, they, they got uh, Skadden Arps, a very big firm in New York, which was happy to work with them on a pro bono basis because it was good advertising for Skadden Arps. And they got one of the, one of the partners, uh, uh, got it, used one of his assistants, uh, you know, uh, and he, he phoned somebody at, at Princeton, I mean, this is the level they work, and said, give me a list of three or four philosophers who might be of value in this. And so, you know, they, he started phoning them. At the end of his phone call, he'd say, give me a, a couple more names. Well, it wasn't long before my name started to come up. And uh, at least it partly serendipitous because uh, not only was I there and I'd worked on Darwin, so I was sort of pre-adapted to this, but also the most prominent person who might have been my, I won't say my rival, my, my, my other, as it were, was David Hull, who, uh, as he uh, made no notes, uh, made no uh, bones about this, was gay. And he was very, un he said, I don't want to be up there on, on a witness stand in Arkansas because they're going to bring up my sexual orientation before we finish the first sentence. He said, I, please understand, I'm proud of my, I'm not hiding it, I'm proud of my sexual orientation. But there are times where I realized that discretion is the better form of valor. So it, anyhow, it ended with me at a, at a small uh, young university in Canada uh, that I, I found myself going down to Arkansas to be the, uh, the expert witness uh, for philosophy. I should say, they agonized right up almost until the moment I got on the stand as to whether or not they needed a philosopher. I mean, it's one thing to have Gould tell them about the fossil record. It's another thing for philosophers who, as you can tell, first of all, we can't shut up. So we're not good on stand. You know, we, want to, we want to lecture everybody. But secondly, you know, philosophers, are, well, it depends if you look at it this way. It depends if you look at it that way. Uh, uh, but fortunately, they found somebody who was quite happy to, to wade in and say, you know, creation science is, is not science. Uh, I'm not a Popperian, but Popper was the big thing. I said, you know, it's not falsifiable. I mean, uh, I should say my fellow philosophers after I did this, all, all this centered on me, even more than the Marxists for doing this. But anyhow, so I, anyhow, we were successful. And I don't know whether this or not, but I always felt I, I, the next year I got a Guggenheim Fellowship, which certainly Americans will know is just about the most prestigious fellowship that you can apply for and get. I mean, maybe a MacArthur gives you more money, but the Guggenheim, and I got one. I've always felt that it was very much a, almost a thank you to me for, for standing up for evolution. I, I mean, I think I'd earned it. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not, but anyhow. So I thought then what am I going to do? I've got a year off. What, and, so I got in touch with Wilson and said, what about my coming and spending a sabbatical with you? As it happens, I, I then discovered that Wilson was the head of the Guggenheim <laughs> Grant Commission. So it was a good choice. Anyhow, I ended up spending a year down with Ed Wilson. Uh, when I say I was in his lab, I, I don't, you know, I, know, I wasn't in his lab. I mean, God, what would, I mean, I'm a philosopher. I, you know, what do I have to do with ants? But over the year, we decided to write a couple of papers, and we did. We wrote a, a couple of papers uh, on uh, on evolution and ethics because Ed was. I mean, this was our, you know, the place where we, as it were, overlapped. And we wrote a couple of papers, and uh, we got them published, and they were fairly high publicity. So, what I'm saying is uh, that this forged a bond, as it were, between me and Ed. And uh, at the at the time, I, my present wife. I was there with my present wife. I was a 43 year old full professor. She was a 20 year old undergraduate. And I said to Ed, Ed, I have to tell you, I have a, a somewhat, let us say, irregular, uh, uh, irregular family situation. It's not normal, but I'm, ha and he, he looked at me and smiled and said, oh Mike, you with a younger woman, it's perfectly normal. It's perfectly normal. <laughs> I, I should say Ed Wilson would be the last person ever to find himself in that sort of situation. Anyhow, it, forged, it not only forged a bond between me and Ed, but between me and, and Lizzie, my wife. And interestingly, later on, when we got our third child and we were agonizing over what to call him, we decided, why not call him Ed? So that's really our nice. Third child, that's really nice. I didn't know that last bit. You must have met him there for about the time I did, because I was very fortunate. He'd come over to England and uh, 
was doing some work at Cambridge and my PhD supervisor, Tim Clutton Brock, who at the time was working on Red Deer, invited me to dinner with him. And I was slightly in awe because this was a good sort of five, six years after sociobiology had um, been published. And I can remember when that extraordinarily large book was published because I was then just starting my undergraduate career. Um, and I couldn't afford to buy the book because uh, in English money, I can still remember, I'm fairly sure it cost 16 pounds because it was a mammoth tome, as you will remember. And uh, initially was only in hardback. And I can remember trying to persuade, I think because I wanted her to be my girlfriend, somebody to go halves on it, but she wasn't having any of that. So I had to wait until my mother gave it to me as a Christmas present. <laughs> I mean, you've already alluded to sociobiology. I think that was the book that in the public's mind is still probably more associated with him than any other, even though two others of his books won the Pulitzer Prize and so on. Can you say a bit about the impact of any of his writing that you felt, not just on narrow academia, but on the public more generally, Mike? Yes. Well, let's, let's pull back a little bit. Uh, Ed did his PhD at Harvard in the 1950s. He, he'd been an undergraduate, I think, at the University of Alabama. He was a yep. Southerner. And, but he ended up at Harvard, got his PhD, and then got a job at Harvard as a junior professor. Hmm. A, a year before uh, Jim Watson came, you know, Jim Watson of double healing. <laughs> and uh, I rather gather they were two egos uh, at work there because Ed has referred to Jim Watson as the most unpleasant human being he's ever met in his whole life because yeah. Watson, Watson was all for molecularizing everything where Ed was a, an organismic biologist. I mean, yeah, this in a way, this makes the whole Marxist thing so ridiculous because of all the people who was an anti-reductionist, it was Ed Wilson. Mm -hmm. He was the one who was saying, You've got to take whole organisms seriously. You mm. cannot. I mean, yes, of course, I'm not against molecular biology, but to think that molecular biology is the beginning and the end and the middle is just mm. wrong. So, mm. as I say, but in the 1960s, Ed um, Ed got involved uh, with uh, a, a man called Robert MacArthur at at uh, Princeton, and they worked on biogeography, particularly island biogeography, and you know how how often they get invaded and how, the, how they settle and that sort of thing. And this set a pattern for Ed because Ed always liked, he was the, as it were, the field biologist, the organismic biologist, but he always liked to work with, let's say, a technical expert. Yep. And MacArthur was a mathematician. Yep. And so it was a perfect fusion. And they yep. wrote on island biogeography. Bio and to this day, I don't think any evolutionary biologist, any biologist would deny that this was a major, major achievement. No, so agree. by the time we go on. I agree. Well, I can remember that book very well because my mathematics is reasonably OK and it's a beautifully mathematically produced argument. And he was good at choosing his co-authors. They yes. complemented each other, as you say. And it was very important in a number of studies because at the time, the common assumption among conservation biologists was that if you had a choice between a single big reserve and a number of small nature reserves of the same total area, the obvious thing was to go for the number of small reserves because they'd have a greater variety of habitats, so you'd have more species. And of course, what they argued is, well, you might have more species to start with, but you would lose species at a greater rate from the smaller reserves mm -hmm. and they wouldn't be recolonized. So as well as being influential among academic biologists, it really had quite a transformative effect on conservation biology and still to this day does. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think you're absolutely right. But the point is by the 1970s, Ed Wilson wasn't just another prof at Harvard. He, he was pretty high profile by then. And as I say, I think that this was a pattern that Ed liked. And uh, the final work that he did uh, in the late 90s with Bert Holdover, where they got their second Pulitzer Prize on ants. Uh, well, Ed was very much the, as it were, overall vision man, if you like, whereas Bert was the guy who was, you know, molecular, but certainly the, the close detail morphologist. Mm. 
uh, that you know that is not to knock Ed and to say Ed didn't do this. He just that wasn't the kind of work that he did. But his genius was to find somebody who did do that, who probably themselves would not make any splash at all. I mean, whether Macar anybody would have heard of MacArthur without Wilson, I don't know. But the point is, it was a very happy symbiotic relationship like that. Now, the reason why I mentioned this is that Ed was at Harvard and Dick Lewinton had been an undergraduate at Harvard. Then he went to Columbia to work with Theodosius Rybchansky, the leading evil on fruit flies, and did very well. And, and then he got into molecular biology and he was the one who discovered molecular variation in, in uh, populations with gel electrophoresis and that sort of thing. And meanwhile, Dick was, as it were, working his way up. He started, he, he was an undergrad at Harvard, grad at Columbia, then I think it was North Carolina assistant professor, University of Rochester associate professor, where incidentally I was a student and I met him for the first time, then full professor at, at Chicago, and then da dum da dum da dum in the early 1970s, you know, named professor at, at Harvard. And uh, Ed was keen to get, I've always had the suspicion, Ed denies it, I've always had the susp suspicion that Ed rather hoped that mm -hmm. he and Lewinton could collaborate. Mm -hmm. It would make perfectly good sense. I mean, mm -hmm. Lewinton was the leading, as it were, molecular evolutionist of the day. I mean, mm -hmm. he wasn't just a, a Jim Watson type. I mean, he worked, I mean, he'd been a student at Dubchansky, so he mm -hmm. was an evolutionist first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And I've always had the feeling that Ed thought, you know, Dick can do, as it were, the, 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 the genetic side, and I'll do the natural history side. Uh, as I say, Ed denies this, uh, but, I've still got that suspicion. Uh, uh, so anyhow, so as I say, Wilson uh, in the 1970s, as it were, turned more and more, and it wasn't just he, because in the 1960s, as you well know, uh, William Hamilton, Bill Hamilton, came up with some models for social behavior. And the whole area of social behavior changed from rather fuzzy, you know, ethology in the 50s of group selection and all of these sorts of things and killer apes and that sort of thing. And in the 1960s, got really properly professionalized with people like uh, William Hamilton, Bill Hamilton, and probably the overall, as it were, guru was John Maynard Smith. Who and you, you uh, probably know that John was the one of the two examiners of Bill Hamilton for his PhD. And when John read the thesis, of course, highly intelligent man, mathematically very capable, he just immediately realized the importance of yeah. what Hamilton was doing and rushed off and wrote a paper for Nature where he, John, introduced the phrase kin selection, which, of course, Darwin hadn't used. Darwin, as you know better than I do, had used family selection, and Bill Hamilton hadn't used it either because he was a typical nerdy mathematician, but John could communicate and for quite a while that produced a bit of tension between them because not surprisingly you're a doctoral student who's just got your doctorate and then 12 months later you find your key idea in one sense in a paper in nature without you as a co-author though that's being a bit unfair to John and Smith but the point is I agree with you what Hamilton did made intelligent people like Ed Wilson and John Maynard Smith realize how this could transform their discipline. Yes, I, I, I don't think there's any doubt. And uh, then who was the chap who did reciprocal altruism? Robert Trivers was, right. was a grad student at Harvard. Yeah. So Ed, I mean, the point is, it was, as it were, brought to Ed's attention, <laughs> even if he'd you know, not been interested. But as he, as he said, he read Trivers and said, uh, not Trivers, Hamilton, and said, Oh my F God, uh, although he would never ever use the F word. No. Uh, uh, but oh, you know, yeah, oh my goodness. Uh, and of course, being Ed, that led to him working. And of course, it, it built up into this massive book that he published in the mid, mid uh, 70s. So, the, I mean, Ed would never say he was not the first sociobiologist, he was not the mathematician sociobiologist. But I do think in absolute fairness, he was the great synthesizer yep. in a way that, I mean, he, I mean, he said, my book is modeled on Julian Huxley's exactly. evolution. I mean, he said the title, Evolution, the Modern Synthesis, Sociobiology, the New Synthesis. And he, he was quite open, you know, yep. that he was paying, as it were, tribute 
to, to Huxley for what he did in the early uh, in the 1940s, where he took the whole neo-Darwinism synthetic theory had come along, and what what Julian Huxley did was, as it were, synthesize it and give us the overall picture of what was going on. And I think that that's what Ed, you know, wanted to do himself. I, I think to be fair to Ed, Ed was more of a biologist than, than, than Huxley ever was. I think by the, by the, by the 30s, even the, the 20s, Huxley had pulled back from yeah. formal biology and he was much more into, well, he, he did that big book with H.G. Wells and his son. And mm -hmm. by the, by, he was, you know, he was, became, what was it, uh, first secretary general of UNESCO yes. and that sort of thing. So, I mean, you know, he did, yeah. what he did was wonderful, but he wasn't, as it were, a lab hands-on biologist. Yeah. Uh, in a way that Ed was, yeah. and so, but as I say, it was what Ed did was very consciously, you know, thinking back 1930s. You had people like uh, Fisher and Sewell Wright, and then Dubshansky and what they call him Henry Ford, and others doing all this work. And Huxley saw, yeah, there's something here. I'm going to bring it together in a synthesis. Yeah. And I think Ed, Ed was doing very much the same thing. He saw all of this in the 1960s. I mean, he, you know, he was at Harvard. He was, you know, he was right at the edge of this. And then, as it were, he said, yeah, this is my field. I work with ants and you can't get a more social species than ants. Uh, let's do the big picture. And, you know, I will always say, if I'm going to give Ed credit, as it were, as the major biologist of his time, it would be sociobiology, the modern, the new synthesis, um, despite all the controversies. So that's where we're at there. And, and on the controversy, I think it's really interesting because as you mentioned, um, in many ways, Ed Wilson was a whole organism biologist. Yep. And yep. yet, whether it's people read him in this way or whether he wrote in this way, as soon as sociobiology came out in 75, he was seen as a reductionist, as somebody mm -hmm. not only as a reductionist, but as a rather naive reductionist who thought that everything to do with behavior, including human behavior, came down to these rather crude models that followed from genetics. Do you think that was fair or unfair? I, 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 think, it, I think it's both fair, but at a certain level misleading. I don't think there's any question that Ed you know, went into it pretty naively, let's put it that way. Mm. He, he certainly didn't cover his backside against the attacks that were coming his way. Mm. And I think that when Lewinton and Gould, who don't forget were in the same department, you know, published this joint you know, with a number of others, uh, this, uh, this letter in, the, what was it, the New York Review of Books, yep. uh, after Ed's book had been very, you know, favorably reviewed there, uh, uh, by Waddington, by Conrad Waddington. Oh. Uh, uh, they wrote, you know, and said it, you know, it, it's, and I think Ed was completely blindsided by that one. Mm. Uh, I, I, but the point is, you know, Michael, I, I think now, and I always thought, a lot of this was Harvard super egos. I mean, they, they were the paradigm of sociobiology at work. I mean, you know, you had Ed already established there. He could only see out of one eye. He was mm. he had a Southern accent. You know, he was a mild <laughs> man at that level. Mm. You've got Dick Lewinton. And if I say he was, you know, from a New York Jewish background and very strong on this, uh, you know, who worked his way up back to Harvard. Uh, mm. you know, it, there was, you know, it was almost foreordained mm. that you were going to get, as it were, naked mud wrestling. Mm. Uh, uh, incidentally, can I just mention, I, I said from a Jewish background, uh, this, is, this is an interesting side thing, which is worth bringing up. I remember Ernst Meyer pointing out to me, you know, Ernst Meyer, the leading evolutionist. He said, you know, Michael, the Science for the People group, that was the ones who were attacking uh, Ed. He said, have you noticed that all of them are Jews? And I said, oh, yeah. Now, Ernst was, was German, but he'd left, uh, he'd left Germany before Hitler came to power. So, you know, uh, but uh, Ed, uh, um, uh, Meyer said, you know, my feeling is that a lot of what's going on here is that a lot of these people like Lewinton are suffering from Holocaust guilt. Because again, to pick up, 
It was the 1960s that the Holocaust suddenly became big time because Israel had invaded and, you know, and taken over the West Bank. They needed some way to defend themselves. Hmm. So, you know, this was when Holocaust studies suddenly shot into, a, you know, you can't criticize, you know, Israelis because of the Holocaust. And I think, uh, no, uh, let me put it this way. Ernst uh, said, you know, he said, I think a lot of these people are feeling guilt that they escaped the Holocaust because they grew up in comfortable middle class families in New York City. And this is their way, as it were. Of, and I actually asked Steve Gould about this because I knew Steve through the uh, Arkansas thing. I asked Steve about this. He, he stopped for a moment and he thought, you know, he said, I don't think it's the whole story. But, you know, yes, I think there's a significant truth to what Maya said. He said, I do think that many of us, I don't even want to say all of us, are motivated by a feeling that this is something we can do for all those dead co-religionists, as it were. I mean, I don't, I don't think this is a bad thing. And you know, I, I, I'm not. I mean, it's got nothing to do with semitism or anti-semitism. But as I say, Steve himself said, you know, I think we, there was a ma ma major motivation there. So anyhow, as, as it were. So the, the, just to pick up. Yeah, you're right. I think Ed was very naive about a lot of this and, as it were, got blindsided. What I think is really interesting is something which really only became really clear to the historians, you know, 20, 30 years later, you know, by the time we get into this century, was that, in fact, Ed Wilson, he, he was not... I, when I say he was deceptive, I don't mean he was living a double life. I don't mean he he, he had one agenda but pretended to be something else. I mean, it was not it, it was not Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of thing. I mean, it wasn't that. But Ed, as I say, let me. Oh, I'm getting unplugged just a moment. Uh, Ed, as I say, came from Harvard. He was educated at Harvard. Now, Harvard had a tradition, or Harvard biology of organicism of and this goes back at least to the 1910s 1920s where people like William Morton Wheeler were huge huge Herbert Spencer groupies why wouldn't they be Herbert Spencer had been far more popular in America than Charles Darwin at the time that these men were growing up you know 1880 1890 1900 I mean Spencer was the name and I I don't think there's any question that that Ed, one of Ed's supervisor was had as his supervisor Wheeler. So Ed was a, an intellectual grandchild of Wheeler. And I think, as, as the historians are now pointing out, in many respects, Ed Wilson was far more of an organicist than a mechanist, if, you, if I can put it that way. I mean, I don't mean he was anti-Darwin. Of course, he was a Darwinian, but he was clearly he saw things organically. In a way, let's say that I don't think John Maynard Smith ever did. Let's mm. to take take an example. Um, that go on. You, and as you well know, it it all blew up rather oddly because having had this sort of quite tight cabal of evolutionary biologists all on side about things like it's all individual selection, kin selection, reciprocal altruism. You mentioned Trivers earlier on, and group selection is just pathetic and can't possibly have any veracity. Another 15 years later, as you well know, we find E.O. Wilson with some other very good mathematicians beginning to write articles suggesting it's not as simple as that. And again, he was vilified, wasn't he? Yeah, by, by, by his fellow evolutionists. He yeah. came out strongly and said, I think group selection, you know, the idea that evolution works for the group, rather than only for the individual. He said, I think group selection not only exists, but is a powerful evolutionary force. You're right. I mean, I think it was 146 evolutionary biologists penned a letter to, to nature saying, yep. you know, Ed, you're full of it. And, and of course, Ed being Ed, loved every moment. Because apart from anything else, there wasn't the vitriolic, you know, thing of the, of the 70s. I mean, these were people disagreeing. But there were people disagreeing who could go off and have a drink afterwards. I'm not sure that Ed ever would, but you know what I mean. He'd be very happy to sit down and have a Starbucks with you after it was after the after the argument. I think it, it worked that way. So I think the point you're making is very important. Now you've asked me because I want to swing back in a moment. Well, I, I think it's a good point because 
you're you're quite positive there about how that controversy might have affected the individuals and i'm encouraged of what you said about how ed wilson might have reacted to that famous letter in nature but i'm pretty confident that a lot of the people penning it simply thought he was past it you know here's a chap who's mm -hmm. 20 years older than i am he doesn't know mm -hmm. any mathematics pathetic and i think they were deeply condescending and then, as you know very well, being both a historian and a philosopher, pendula tend to swing. And now, yeah. looking back, it doesn't seem quite as clear cut as those. No, I, those to I, I agree. Point. I mean, look, I, I let, let me be quite clear about it. I don't, I don't know about you, Michael, but I'm a pretty hard line individual sure. selection. So, you know, I think Charles Darwin was and Michael Roos is. Mm. Uh, uh, and so, but you're absolutely right. I think that the swing to group selection is deeply what shall I say, deeply instructive about Ed Wilson. And this flips me back to the Ed Wilson of the 70s, because one of the things that a lot of people, certainly the philosophers all took umbrage at, was Ed said, you know, throw away everything you've done in ethics and moral philosophy. It's all BS. Although, again, dear Ed would never use language like that. But, you know, it's all BS and, and you've got to recognize it's evolutionary biology. But this is the thing. He wanted to say what's happening is evolution is progressive. It leads up to humans. And therefore, humans are of the greatest value. Therefore, what, what is our moral obligation but to cherish and help humans and push them forward? And, of course, the interesting thing is Ed became, as you know, very dedicated to biophilia, to the idea of all organisms. But if you look at what Ed is saying, he is not saying, like uh, some of the, uh, some of the um, what Holmes Ralston the, the third, for instance, wants to say that trees have rights in, you know, dignity in their own right. Ed was never like that. Ed was always, if you look at what he says, is don't get rid of these, you know, these plants in the, the Amazon, because it could well be that they're going to have great medicinal value for human beings. So, so Ed in that was, sense, exactly, in that sense, he's not a deep ecologist. No, uh, no, no, no. Uh, but um, the, the interesting it, thing, yeah, the interesting thing is, who is the person who pushed, as it were, progress, evolution, ethics? Uh, Herbert Spencer. Hmm. I mean, that, uh, I mean, and of course, this is what happened. G. Moore went after him and said, oh, you're committing the naturalistic fallacy. You can't get is for ought. And I grew up in the 60s. I, I joke and I say there were three eternal verities. The naturalistic fallacy is, 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 is right. Uh, even the nicest boys only want one thing, and Americans have terrible table manners. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, these were these were absolute truths. <laughs> I, as I say, I still think the naturalistic fallacy is right, and I still, having had three boys of my own now, I still distrust even the nicest boys <laughs> and American table manners. Well, you know, it, by God, do you remember this, Michael? They would cut up their meat with a knife, and then they would eat it with a fork. <laughs> well, of course, nobody use, uses knives and forks anyway. It's all fast food, so that you know, that's gone by the by. But uh, now we've, it was we've amazing. Now, we've now got to the point that I really hoped we were going to be able to talk about, as you say, table manners. Um, but I was thinking about Wilson and biophilia, and the fact, as you said, that in a sense, it's really a very uh, anthropocentric argument. Absolutely, absolutely, completely. And it, you've got to understand that he mm. is an organicist mm. rather than a mechanist. He goes, I mean, I mean, he goes back to Schelling. I doubt that Ed has ever heard of Schelling, let alone read it. Yes. But, but uh, he'd certainly heard of Spencer and read Spencer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no question about that. So I, I see Ed completely in this thing. So you see, for Ed, evolutionary ethics was a natural. Now, as it happens, I, and I think there were others too, were working towards, we were starting to say, yeah, we think the naturalistic fallacy is right, but you know, face up to it, folks, the most important truth that we've learned in the last 200 years is as Thomas Henry Huxley used to say, humans are not, you know, we're, you know, we're not, we're not miracles. We're modified mud, you know, uh, that, 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 that's what we are. Uh, that we were not created on the sixth day by a good God. And whether or not God exists, we're the products of evolution. And the fact that we are products of evolution means that even if the naturalistic fallacy is valid, we 
still have the obligation to take seriously in our philosophy the fact that we are modified, we are, what is it, modified monkeys rather than modified mud. And uh, that's a lovely way to put it, isn't it? And so uh, a number of us, and I was one, but I think there were others too, in the 80s were trying to say, how can we deal with this? And of course, what we decided was the way to do it is to do an end run around the naturalistic fallacy is ought and say, yes, but what we can do in evolutionary ethics is we can show that it, that evolution can tell you why we believe things ethically. We can also show you that, that, that that's all you're ever going to get. And so, you know, so in other words, Ed, thinks that evolution justifies ethics, whereas somebody like me thinks that evolution explains ethics, but doesn't deny ethics, of course not, but it explains why there can be no objective justification, whether or not it's God's will, or whether or not it's the course of evolution. And as, as you know, Ed and I wrote this, you know, I'd like to say classic paper. I think it is. It's certainly been reprinted a number of times. Uh, and um, where Ed, we say, you know, we say something like, uh, evolution shows us the way forward with ethics. Uh, Ed thinks evolution justifies ethics. I mm -hmm. think evolution explains away ethics and shows there can be no objective justification. So, yeah, we, we knew we, we got different, but it was, and I, I'm still proud of it. It was a clarion call mm -hmm. to yeah. say, philosophers, you stupid, and again, another word that Ed would not use, but it begins with A, it ends with holes. Uh, but, it, it, you know, you've got to take seriously. We are modified monkeys, not modified mud. And it, God damn it, it has to matter when we come to talking about certainly epistemology, but what do we know? But even more about ethics, the whole way that we behave, the way that we behave, for instance, with respect to children, that even if they're not our children, if you're passing by and you see a child fallen down and crying, you know in yourself you've got a moral obligation. You cannot just walk by. You might do, but you know that you're doing wrong. I mean, <laughs> why is this? Well, because we're a social species. I mean, if we were, if we were orangutans, who, who had the male, you know, it's wham bam, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> we, you know, we'd pass by without a moment's hesitation, but we don't. And so. As I say, a lot of us were feeling that, uh, so this is why for me, Ed Wilson is, as a philosopher, tremendously important. He showed me the, the way we should be taking. He did not show me the path I should take, hmm. but he certainly showed me the direction in which I should be facing. He turned me around from looking, as it were, back at the bleak thing to looking forward to the fertile valleys. Now, as it happens, my, you know, my fertile valley was not Ed's fertile valley. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yea, though I took, walked in the valley of deer, <laughs> I shall fear no evil. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, actually, can we, I, I don't want to end without bringing this point in. Uh, I think a lot of us, and Ed, Ed, was never, Ed was never that interested in science and religion. I mean, he talked about it. He grew up as a fundamentalist. He wanted to reach out to fundamentalists, but I don't think he was ever, it, he, I don't think he was ever interested in the sorts of things that we are interested in and that the society of which you're president are interested in. But I think a lot of us, and certainly me, uh, have seen that this you know, leads us forward to talking about the God issue. And of course, you know, on the one hand, it helps that we got the creationists who are, you know, balmy the one way. On the other hand, it helps we got the new atheists who are balmy the other way. And uh, I should say, the, the creationists have often disagreed with me, that they have never sneered at me privately or publicly. Whereas my good friend Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion calls me the Neville Chamberlain. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I'm the kind of person who would rather be mentioned than not mentioned. I believe that there's no publicity, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And so I'm not about to complain about this, but as you know, I think what has made the whole, our society, the sort of raison, raison d'etre of our society, why our society is so unbelievably vital at the moment, is that on the one hand, we don't have, to have the, but we had the intelligent design people. We've got all the American evangelicals who are basing their views on, you know, 
Why are they anti-abortion? They're not, I mean, they're not anti-abortion because it has anything to do with science. Whether or not it's got anything to do with science, that's not where they're at. It, it, actually, it's got nothing to do with Christianity either because certainly, you know, uh, uh, if you look at August, St. Augustine, I mean, he, he thinks abortion is wrong, but he doesn't think it's murder, neither does Aquinas. Uh, so on the one hand, you've got the evangelical, and then on the other hand, you've got the nutters, uh, like, well, he's not, but, but like Richard Dawkins and, uh, you know, some of the others, Dan Dennett, and uh, other, who, as has been pointed out, are unbelievably ethnocentric, and, you know, they're prejudiced about Muslims. You know, <laughs> they could give, you know, a, 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 you know, they could give a slave owner a good run for their money when they start talking about Muslims. I mean, you know, and, and in total, total ignorance of anything, you know, which holds about Muslims. I mean, I, I'm not trying to convert you or anybody to, to Islam, but, you know, if I'm going to run it down, I think I should know something about it, you know. Um, so, as I say, I, this is why I find today the science religion issue, which for me is bound up with issues like ethics and these sorts of things. They're not separate things. That's why I find these incredibly exciting and very vital. I've just finished a book to advertise myself on, on hate, which is coming out with Oxford later, later this spring, where, you know, basically I'm dealing on the one hand with evolution. I'm talking about our evolution as uh, hunter gatherers and all of that sort of thing, the, the impact of, of, the impact of uh, agriculture, uh, how religion rose up, uh, how religion influences, for instance, things like just war theory, not just Cicero, but Augustine and all of these things. I mean, it's, a, it's the most wonderful, it's the most wonderful, what shall I say, mix. And I'm 81, I've just retired after 55 years as a prop, and I have never been more excited about my field than ever before. I mean, it, I, I, I mean you know, I'm going to pass the baton on, and I'm, I'm unbelievably happy to do that. I'm an evolutionist. You know, I've had my time. Pass it on to, the, to younger people like Anthony Nairn, who, as, as we discovered, is very good at computers, so he's clearly under 15. Uh, you know, Anthony, you've got a whole program ahead of you. Uh, but as I say, that's why I think our society is, you know, I'm proud to be a member. I, I would feel ashamed of myself if I were not a member. There you go. How's that? <laughs> And I was just thinking, I think you're right that Fred Wilson, the science religion issue was not one that interested him. I don't think, frankly, religion interested him very much. For most of his adult life, he seems to have said very little about it, except that he thought it would be cannibalized by yep. a good understanding of biologists. And when pushed, I think he described himself quite often as an agnostic, but a bit like Darwin himself, towards the end of his life, he was more comfortable identifying as an atheist, I think. I but Darwin, I think, no, Darwin at the end of his life said, I'm an agnostic. He said, I'm not a hardline. No, yeah. Oh, but, Ed, but, Ed Wilson? Yeah, he, he got a bit more clear in a sense about identifying. I mean, well, as you know, Darwin, going back to Darwin, you know his autobiography. It may yeah. have been technically yeah. agnostic, but nevertheless. But I always great. had a feeling that Ed Wilson is a bit like my wife, Lizzie. You know, there are agnostics like me who worry about it nonstop ever since, ever since I lost my faith as a Quaker when I was 20. And people like me who, and, and Julian Huxley was another, and Thomas Henry Huxley, you know, yeah, being an agnostic means that's just the start. And then yeah. you've got people like my wife who basically are not sure about the relationship between Abraham and Isaac. And they're not terribly keen. Maybe they were gay lovers, you know. And I say, no, no, you've got it's David and Jonathan who are the gay <laughs> yes, lovers. <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm a Quaker, and because Quakers don't read the Bible, but I have an incredible knowledge of the Bible because I've given so many talks where I've had to sleep in a hotel in a strange part of the world <laughs> where I couldn't sleep in the middle of the night. And what is the only reading material available? The Gideon Bible. So, if John, uh, Michael. You're a, 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 an Anglican priest. I bet I've spent more time reading the Old Testament than you have. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy conceding that. As you intimated a minute or two ago, we better draw this saddish conclusion. But um, it's always fun talking with you, Michael. And, you know, thank you, because apart from your academic work, it's directly relevant to Ed Wilson's life. You are somebody who worked with him and, and knew him for, uh, you know, over 40 years or so. So that's really, really appreciated.
keep well, yeah. but I think we'll finish there. I, I, well, I, I, let me just put one final plug in, folks. Michael, Reese, and I have been working on a book on the new atheists. No, I'm sorry, the new <laughs> biology. The new biology! What the hell am I saying? And I think, let me put it this way. It's now with the referees. And I think after, what, five years, this is the first time we've had a version where if it was sent to me to referee, I would say, accept this. So there you go. <laughs> Nicely put to end with. Thanks ever so much. Keep well, Michael, as always. Uh, you too. Cheers Thanks there. a lot. Bye. Goodbye.